Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I, I've been talking to, to Mandy and looking a little, uh, learning more about Mandy. Um, so that's been a pleasure. I'm Marianne Lax, and I'm the Senior Manager of Education and Outreach at the Maltz Museum. And uh, thank you, Mandy uh, Shannon, and I'll tell you a little bit more about her in a second. But first, I just want to tell you a little bit about the program um, today at the Maltz. It's called Banned Books, Navigating the Current Landscapes. And before we get into that, uh, I know I sound like I'm all over the place, and I'm sorry, I got to focus. Um, but um, I just want to talk a little bit about the Maltz Museum and about our current exhibit, which is The Girl in the Diary, Searching for Rivka from the Woods Ghetto, which helps us to look to history, to understand our present, and consider our role in creating a better future. And we all feel, I think, can agree that the story of Rivka and this particular exhibit really has never felt more urgent. Um, the exhibit will be on display at the museum through April, and I hope that you will consider a trip into the museum to see this powerful and moving exhibit that originated at the Galicia Museum in Poland. The other thing I wanna encourage people to do is to visit our website, maltzmuseum.org for a complete listing of our upcoming programs that were just pretty much just posted. Um, and I just wanna let you know that um, we have an in-person program coming up this Wednesday that I would encourage anybody who's interested in particularly Superman and Min Marilyn Monroe, um, to join us to talk to the authors of the book, American Way, A True Story of Nazi Escape, Superman and Marilyn Monroe. And I also want to let people know that we are also going to be starting meditation classes at the end of January, and those are both in person. So, but focusing on today, which is virtual. And I want to say again, thank you to everybody who's joining us today. And our presenter, Mandy Shannon, is Associate Professor and Director of Teaching, Research, and Engagement at the University of Dayton's Roche Library. I hope I'm saying that right. Gosh, but you're close. Okay. okay. Uh, so she has a master's degree in political science and library science, and her research focuses on information literacy in the classroom and the political world. Mandy is the co-author of Vital Statistics on American Politics, which provides historical and statistical information on all aspects of American politics, along with data literacy lessons to teach data researchers how to wade through the sea of data. So I'm going to turn it over to Mandy. We welcome you and thank you for being here. Thank you very much and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for joining. And thanks to Marianne and the Maltz Museum for inviting me to talk with you today. I'm delighted to be talking to you about the current status of book banning. And as a librarian who's interested in the intersection of information literacy and political and civic engagement, this is a really natural fit for me. Um, I do talk a lot about situating information with context, which is one of the reasons I think it's important to keep in mind that my background is in political science and librarianship that will inform the way I approach this today. I moved into librarianship by way of public libraries, where I spent seven years focused on adult reference services and readers advisory, which leads a service providing personalized book recommendations to readers. I've been in academic libraries for over 10 years, and in this role, I work with college students, teaching them research skills broadly defined as information literacy. So academic libraries, as we'll talk about in a bit, see very few book challenges. And I mention all of this background, um, not because I think you're particularly interested in my background, but because all of this shapes the way I approach this topic. When we're talking about book challenges and book bans in the current context, we could spend hours or days or truly a semester on this. So I want to acknowledge that my background and experience shapes what I've chosen to focus on and the way I talk about it as we narrow this very big topic down to an hour. So in terms of what I have decided to focus on, we're going to start by talking about some background and history of book banning. 
move into the current climate of book challenges and bans, and then talk about some practical ways to do something about this in your community to protect intellectual diversity and freedom of expression. And we will have time at the end for questions at, as there's interest. So in 1953, a group of professors, librarians, publishers, and business people met to discuss what they called the current wave of censorship and attacks on books and libraries. This meeting that started over concern about censorship led to the development of the Freedom to Read Statement. It's since been amended several times, but the opening line has remained the same over the 70 years since it was first issued. The freedom to read is essential to our democracy. It is continuously under attack. So what does that mean to say that the freedom to read is continuously under attack? We can look at examples throughout history and across the globe. If you go all the way back to the third century BC, Emperor Shuang of the Qin Dynasty ordered the burning of works that presented a version of history that he saw as a threat to his power. He wanted to strengthen his ideological control, so all folk, folk books and historical records other than the history of Qin were banned and burned, and even talking about them could be punished by death. Very often, when we think about book banning, we think of scenes like that in this photo. Just four months after Hitler took power, the Nazi regime burned over 25,000 books at once, as part of the growing Nazi attack on un-German expression. And by the end of World War II, an estimated 16 million Polish books and manuscripts were destroyed as part of an attempt to wipe out Polish culture and history. And it's estimated that over a third of all books in Germany were burned before the end of the war. Sky Perryman, who is the president and CEO of Democracy, Democracy Forward, a nonprofit that challenges and aims to disrupt anti-democratic movements, has noted that in countries where there's a movement to restrict freedom of expression, where there's a political movement to make people afraid of ideas or learning or history, those are often situations where there are broader attacks on fundamental values. What does that look like in our country and our climate today? Well, before we jump into today, I think it's important to narrow down this focus a little bit from third century China and 1940s Germany to understand some background on the history of the US's particular tension between freedom of information and challenges to standards of decency. So this is a very abbreviated timeline with things that I picked in particular, um, but I want to note that this tension is not new. Arrests for printed work that were deemed unfit for public consumption predate the Republic. And while with what we're used to today in popular culture, the work of Thomas Morton might not seem quite as lascivious as it did in the 17th century, at the time he was called the Lord of Misrule and arrested for his poems, which were seen as a promotion of hedonistic culture. Shortly thereafter, William Pynchon's The Meritorious Price of Redemption was published, but it was banned and burned because it was seen as heretical and anti-Christian. That is frequently cited as the first instance of banned material in what is now the US. But when we look at post-formation of the United States and we look at banning at a national scale, most would point to Uncle Tom's Cabin as the example of the first nationwide banning attention. Published in 1851, it caused all sorts of problems for Harriet Beecher Stowe because she had written it despite laws banning books with anti-slavery content. That led to her receiving death threats and anyone who sold that book was subject to receiving challenges, including an Alabama shopkeeper who was run out of his hometown. Now this National sentiment about protecting the public from obscenity and indecent material really came to a head in the 1873 Bill for the Suppression of Trade. Excuse me, it's a long title. Bill for the Suppression of Trade in and Circulation of Obscene Literature and Articles of Immoral Use. It was commonly called Comstock Act, and that's how I'll refer to it since 
That title is rather long. The Comstock Act granted unprecedented and sweeping powers to government officials to search people's private mail, to confiscate and destroy published materials, and to fine and imprison writers and booksellers, as well as anyone found in possession of material that was deemed illicit. The Comstock Act was in effect for about 100 years. It was actively enforced, and under its enforcement, millions of books, newspapers, magazines, prints, photographs were burned under court order. More than 3,000 people were arrested for violations of the Comstock Act and served a total of 600 years in prison, most for writing about topics including atheism, homosexuality, and sexual health. But like many laws being written today to preemptively prohibit content, the language of the Comstock Act was intentionally vague. See, it's always been the case that obscenity is not protected by the First Amendment, but what constitutes obscenity has changed over time, and it is typically in the eye of the beholder. Probably the most famous example of that, or infamous, depending on your point of view, in 1964, Supreme Court Justice Potter Stewart said that while all speech is protected except for hardcore pornography, he acknowledged that the standard for what defines that is difficult to pin down, but and he quoted, I know it when I see it. Now, Justice Seward regretted ever saying that and ever using that phrase, but there's a non-falsifiable truth in his statement that what we perceive as appropriate and what is not really depends on what we see. Now, in 1973, the Supreme Court got a little bit tired of trying to articulate what obscenity was on a case-by-case -case basis of having to see it to know it, so in the case of Miller versus California, they established what is now called the Miller test, that in order for material to be considered obscene and therefore not protected by the First Amendment, it has to meet all three of these standards. First, that the average person applying local community standards, looking at the work in its entirety, must find that the work appeals to prurient interest. Second, that the work must describe or depict in an obviously offensive way sexual conduct or excretory functions. And I want to note that the second prong also was focused on local community standards. And then third, the, first, the one of prong of these three that looked at a national standard is that the work as a whole must lack serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific values. So in 1973, this Miller test offered an attempt to provide clear criteria and impose some level of objectivity on a very subjective area. Uh, but if you've spent any time looking at this test, you might notice that there is a whole lot of room for interpretation there. What are the local community standards? What defines appealing to prurient interest? What is an obviously offensive way to depict, depict sexual conduct? And perhaps most ambiguously, what is the reasonable person standard for determining if a work lacks value? So while there have been other cases since Miller, the Miller test is still the test used to determine obscenity. And I talk about these standards for obscenity because it is one of the key areas, not only for determining whether materials are protected by the First Amendment, but also because of that, obscenity is often used as a rationale for challenging books and those who are attempting to ban books try to explain how materials fail this test or how this test is not relevant to the case they're making. So one of the cases that some make for the Miller test not applying to a challenge or attempted ban of books is the specific case of availability of materials to children and whether there are different standards for when books are deemed unsuitable and should be banned when the primary audience is in a school library or a children's area of a library. When it comes to banning books in schools, in 1975, a group of parents complained about a group of nine books, which included titles like Slaughterhouse-Five and Langston Hughes's Best Short Stories by Negro Writers. And they said that these were anti-American, anti-Christian, anti-Semitic, and quote, just plain filthy. 
So the school district removed the books, but students challenged that, saying that books were removed because they offended parents, not because they didn't have educational value. In this case, the Supreme Court ruled in the students' favor and said that the government, in this case the public school, can't restrict free speech because it doesn't agree with the content. In this opinion, they reaffirmed the transcendent imperative of First Amendment rights, and they clarified that those rights included the right to receive information and ideas as part of the umbrella of freedom expression under the constitutional guarantee of free speech. They also made distinctions between the books assigned as part of the curriculum in the classroom and books that could be found in school libraries. Libraries, they said, are, quote, regimes of voluntary inquiry. They found that school boards have broad discretion to determine the content of curriculum to reflect community standards. So again, note that that local community standard came into play but that the school board's absolute discretion and control of books assigned as part of the classroom curriculum did not extend to the library. To get a little technical for a minute, PICO was a plurality decision, which meant that while a majority of justices decided in the same direction, it didn't have a majority of justices agreeing the same thing for the same reason. Still, for about 40 years, PICO was generally used as a standard in determining how to respond to challenges of book removals from school libraries. It's been cited in cases from Kansas and Arkansas and other states rejecting book removals from school libraries. But starting about 15 years ago, we started to see the strength of PICO showing cracks. First, when the 11th Circuit Court rejected the ACLU's argument that a book removed from a school district in Florida violated PICO, that court said PICO was a non-decision so far as precedent is concerned. It doesn't establish a standard. Now, in that case, the, court, the 11th Circuit Court ruled that books could be removed over factual inaccuracies but they still protected the notion that books couldn't be removed just because the school didn't agree with the ideas in them. More recently, we're seeing more erosion of this ideal, and there's pushback against the ideas that books should remain available in school libraries, even with the library's role as what the court originally called a principal locus of students' ability to gain knowledge. In a 2022 case in Missouri, the school district removed eight books, some permanently, after they received challenges from parents over the content. A student and her parents challenged that, alleging that the complaints were just part of a targeted campaign to de design to remove books with LGBTQ plus themes and themes related to people of color. That case, the plaintiffs ended up voluntarily dismissing the case in large part because the school district put all but one of the books back on the shelf. But the court was really explicit from the outset that the protections school libraries have enjoyed since PICO are not absolute. In part, the court identified a point of contention about what constitutes a ban and therefore removes the ability of students to access the information. They wrote that the district removing these books doesn't ban the books, that what it did is it changed where they could access them. They said that students can borrow the books from a public library or a friend or purchase them. It simply does not involve banning books, they said. So we're starting to see in the past couple of years, the court system coalescing around the idea that school libraries aren't really that different from the curriculum and that if students have access to books in some way, in some place, calling it a ban is hyperbolical and just stokes outrage. So I wanna take a minute to pause and offer some definitions so that we're all on the same page of what these different terms mean. This is admittedly getting into semantics, but I think the semantics here matter for two reasons. First of all, being precise in our words always helps us understand the true context in which we're operating. And at a broader level, when we have conversations with others around this topic, being precise minimizes the risk of us talking past each other 
and losing focus on the real challenges that ex exist. I think probably the most well-known example of this was if you've heard that Amanda Gorman's book of poetry, The Hill We Climb, which she read at President Biden's inauguration was banned across the Miami-Dade school board, school district in the spring of 2023, using the American Library Association's definitions, which are those that are up, it was not in fact banned. It was certainly censored. And in one K, what happened was in one K through eight level school, the book was moved out of the general section of the library into what they called the middle grades leveled area. I am not saying that that's not an issue. I think I would, I would join the ALA in arguing that censorship itself is an impediment to the freedom to read. And I want to acknowledge there's a healthy debate among librarians and teachers about the practice of grade leveling or saying what type of what level of book is appropriate for what grades. But there was a lot of public discourse around those imprecise interpretations that led to those who are challenging books to say that all reactions to their challenges are false. And we know, in fact, that that's not true. Librarians and teachers are facing legal challenges, not to re mention reports of threats of harm and even death threats as a result of providing access to books. So there are very real instances of prosecutors contemplating criminal charges and police being called on librarians and teachers because of claims that they're distributing obscenity to, mi to minors by making books available. These definitions that clarify a challenge, which is an attempt to remove or restrict materials, a ban, which is the, app, the action of removing those materials, and censorship, which is a change in any of the access status of material, are from the American Library Association, or ALA. And these are the definitions that I'll be using when I talk about ALA data. There are other organizations that define this differently. Pen America, for example, would classify all of these things you see on the screen as a ban. So as you engage in conversation with others around you about book challenges, it can be really useful from the outset to make sure that you understand what the terms mean in the same way. So given this context that we've had, that we've had a tension between freedom of expression and concerns for protecting vulnerable populations from obscenity since before our nation was founded, is there anything really unusual in what we're seeing today? And quite simply, yes. You can see a dramatic shift in the velocity of challenges, the number of challenges, the strength of them, the number of titles that were challenged at one time since 2021. There are several organizations that collect this type of data about book challenges and bans, most notably are ALA and PEN America. And I want to take a note to say they all rely on people involving, involved submitting self-reports. So because of that, these are all likely to be undercounts of the true number of challenges that go on every year. The data that you see on the screen are from the ALA's Office of Intellectual Freedom. And while PEN America has separate data, they have also reported comparable trends. So after fairly stable numbers of challenges, ranging from about 200 to 400 a year for about 20 years, in 2021, something dramatic happened. In 2022, the most recent full year with full year data, this dramatic increase in both the number of documented challenges and number of titles challenged continued. And preliminary data from 2023 suggests that this trend continues still. When we dig a little bit deeper into those challenges that were reported, we can see that over half of the 1,269 documented challenges of over 2,500 unique titles reported to ALA in 2022 targeted school libraries and schools. This is a change from just a few years ago. As the language around book challenges focuses more on sweeping claims about child protection Schools and their libraries have seen an increase in challenges. Between 2019 and 2022, the proportion of challenges in school libraries rose by 22 percentage points. 
So in 2019, fewer than one of, in five of challenges were to school libraries materials. And public libraries saw more a higher percentage of the challenges. And that's not to say that public libraries have seen a decrease in challenges. Remember that we're looking at a significantly larger baseline of challenges when we look at these percentages. Preliminary 2023 data suggests that while school libraries continue to see record-breaking numbers of challenges, public libraries are again seeing an increase so that the proportions are leveling out between public and school libraries. To provide a quick overview of preliminary 2023 data, between January 1st and August 31st, 2023, ALA's Office of Intellectual Freedom reported 695 attempts to censor library materials and services and documented challenges to 1,915 unique titles. That's a 20% increase from the same reporting year in 2022, which itself saw the highest number of book challenges since ALA began compiling the data more than 20 years ago. In 2023, preliminary data for the first eight months, 92% of challenges included multiple titles, which is a rise over previous years. And in those first few months, challenges involving 100 or more books in a single challenge were reported in 11 states, including Ohio, compared with six states that reported this during the same period in 2022. And in 2021, there were zero. So this speaks to the changing and coordinated nature of these challenges. Prior to 2020, most challenges were, were challenges to individual titles or one book at a time. When we think about what books these are, in 1939, the American Library Association adopted the Library Bill of Rights, which was drafted the year before by Library Director Forrest Spaulding to speak out against, quote, growing intolerance, suppression of free speech, and censorship affecting the rights of minorities and individuals. At that time and through the 1950s, materials were being targeted out of a moral panic that they contributed to an erosion of traditional values, leading to juvenile delinquency and promoting a culture of what was characterized as sexual deviance. Those folks who drafted the Library Bill of Rights in 1938 and 39 might see some familiarity in today's environment. These are the 13 most challenged books in 2022 books that included topics relating to race, history, gender identity, sexuality, and reproductive health were the most challenged books last year. Graphic novels are the format most frequently challenged, but the vast majority of challenges in 2022 were to books written by or about a person of color or a member of the LGBTQIA community. Preliminary data from 2023 is suggesting that this may be expanding in scope to broader categories, including violence and anything that is seen as challenging what they call traditional values. So Deborah Caldwell Stone, the director of ALA's Office of Intellectual Freedom, says that we are seeing the effects of a well-organized and well-funded campaign to remove certain books from libraries. What does she mean when she talks about well-organized and well-funded? Well, PEN America, which is an organization that works to protect free expression and defend civil liberties related to free expression, identifies first that bans within school libraries are geographically concentrated with 5% of school districts reporting between 100 to 300 instances of bans. And to be precise with my words here, I will note that what the ALA would call a challenge, PEN America does refer to as a ban. You'll note that over three quarters of all districts see fewer than 20 instances of bans. So again, when we look at these school districts, a small number of districts are responsible for banning the most titles. Additionally, PEN America has identified at least 50 groups involved with pushing for book bans across the country. 
73% of those groups have formed since 2021, and they are estimated to have played a role in at least half of the book bans enacted across the country. In 20% of the cases, there are direct links that have been proven, and about 30% of additional cases have evidence of those groups' influence. Now, there are many of these groups, but I think probably most prominent among those that have formed and that have been influential in leading challenges against books is Moms for Liberty, which the Southern Poverty Law Center has named an extremist group. Since its founding in Florida in 2021, it's grown rapidly with chapters across the country and gaining support and funding from political donors. USA, did an anal USA Today did an analysis identifying the concentration of book bans in Florida with the geographic concentration of Moms, of Liberty Moms for Liberty chapters. That's that map of Florida on the left of your screen. And while it's not a perfect one-to-one -one correlation, there is a relationship between the president presence of a Moms for Liberty chapter and the presence of book bans. So because it's a little bit small, I wanna point out that any county that is blue has both Moms for Liberty chapter and has experienced book bans. Any county that is gray has had neither book bans nor a Moms for Liberty chapter. The orange are counties that have a Moms for Liberty chapter with no bans and yellow is book bans without Moms for Liberty chapter. So again, not a perfect relationship, but there you can see that there tend to be some geographical similarities. Again, a growing num additionally, a growing number of challenges, including those mega challenges with multiple titles up to over 100 at one challenge, appear to have ties with a website called booklooks.org. Officially, Booklooks is not affiliated with Moms for Liberty, but there have been questions raised about some of the overlap in multiple dimensions from their approach. Both Moms for Liberty and Booklooks.org have a rating system for books ranging from zero, which is no problems, to five, which is severe problems, and they use similar graphics for those rating systems. Their similarity in membership, a member of Moms, of Moms for Liberty founded Book Looks. The website went live one day after she publicly left Moms for Liberty. And they also have overlap in location of formation. So they were both originated in Brevard County, Florida. And while booklooks.org states that they do not support book bans, they do share that parents can use their information to individually or through groups representing their interest, engage with school boards to determine what works should be made available to their children while under the custodial care of schools. They say they fully support both of those use cases, though they're not directly engaged in it. And on their website, they share that books that may be excluded from school libraries would still be available in public libraries or stores for interested students to get with their parental consent. So again, they mirror some of that language that we are starting to see in court cases of whether banning, removing books from a library really is a ban. Now, I want to be clear that Moms for Liberty is not the only group advocating for censorship. Um, if you are curious, I, I will be sharing a digital handout that you can check out later with links to other groups advocating for censorship across the country to see where they are located. But I highlight Moms for Liberty and booklooks.org because they are prominent and well, Moms for Liberty is well-funded and connections have been clearly found that suggest these are both influential in the current climate towards censorship. So I want to pause for a moment here and acknowledge that this can feel overwhelming. We have always had to balance this challenge between the desire to protect children from obscenity and the imperative to support free speech. But it seems to be moving at a velocity and with a force that's hard to counteract now. And when I start to feel overwhelmed, I often look to something that Rabbi Danya Rutenberg posted on Twitter back when it was still called Twitter in response to a lot of fear and despair and anger she was seeing on the timeline. She said, your homework for today is this. Take a deep breath. 
and focus on one, one thing that you can do to make something better in your sphere of influence, your workplace, your local school, neighborhood, etc. So I find this really helpful personally to remember that I don't have to fix this all at once. But if you're thinking, well, what is that one thing? What can I do? Kristen Dages is the District Media Technology Coordinator for the Hudson, Ohio Local Schools, and she published a blog for the Ohio Educational Library Media Association with what I consider to be a call to awareness. There is a lot going on, but we are well prepared to combat the barriers to access and the challenges to intellectual diversity and freedom of expression. So as I mentioned, I'm going to be sharing, if you haven't already received it, a handout with links to some different resources that are intended to help you identify what your one thing for the day is. And I think there are three general umbrella areas. Get informed, show up, and speak out. So under the broad umbrella of get informed, this includes documents like the Library Bill of Rights and the Freedom to Read Statement. They help provide foundation and context to all of this that's rooted in principles and professional standards rather than getting into the weeds of the content itself. I also provide links to data about book challenges and bans, but I really encourage you to find out what's happening in your local community. Are you in a school district or a public library district that has seen an increase in challenges? These coordinated attacks are happening nationally, yes, but they are implemented at the local level and they are decided at the local level. And so our power starts at the local level. We started today talking about the importance of local community standards in determining what is and isn't obscenity and is therefore protected by that transcendent imperative of the First Amendment. Work at the local level is powerfully important. Find out whether your school district has updated selection policies for its libraries. If your school doesn't have a written current selection policy, the first thing you can do is to talk to school librarians and advocate for a review and update of those policies now before there are challenges. Ask if they have different selection policies at the school district level for instructional materials and library materials. They serve very different purposes and that should be reflected. Is there a separate reconsideration policy, the policy that guides the process when there are challenges to books that requires that books be evaluated individually as a whole and with context? When, it, when I talk about showing up and speaking out, Show up to your local public library and ask if they have needs and if so, what their needs are. Now, let them guide what showing up might look like most effectively at the local level. I can't say what's gonna be most effective for most public libraries because it's going to vary. I'm in an academic library. Academic libraries see less than 1% of all challenges. So I cannot tell you what to do at the local library, let them guide that discussion. Uh, when you show up, there are many organizations that have action-oriented toolkits. I've linked here to United Against Book Bans Action Toolkits that is affiliated with the American Library Association. But you may also want to form an anti-censorship group, a community of individuals who share similar concerns. Speaking up can mean every, anything from showing up and speaking at a school board meeting or a library board, board meeting, and I've included some guidelines there for how to approach those interactions. It may mean writing a letter to the editor of your local community paper, or it may just mean saying something when you hear somebody in your community talking about book challenges and bans. And finally, if you learn of a challenge or a ban in your community, please make sure it's been reported. All of those data that we rely on to understand the context of this are from self-reports. So I've included links on that handout to the ALA reported challenge and PEN America's reported book ban. 
So I hope all of this has been helpful in situating the context for the current climate of book challenges and bans based on the historical progression of tensions and what you can do to support intellectual freedom. I appreciate your time and attention, and I am happy to take questions as you have them. And Mandy, I want to say thank you for an excellent presentation. Um, two things. Uh, I just want to let everybody know that you have not received the digital resources that Mandy has referenced, but you will after today's presentation. So look for that in your uh, email. Um, the second thing I want to encourage our questions, um, and you can put them in the Q&A, and um, we can um, answer them as they come. You know, um, as we're waiting for questions, I have um, I, I have a few questions. You know, you mentioned the Comstock Act. Um, we kind of hear that referenced a lot. Um, can you talk a little bit about how that's how that is relevant to today and the things that are going on today? Yeah, so there's actually a growing number of proposed bills and legislation across the country, primarily at the state level, although I am aware of one at the federal level that's been proposed uh, to regulate obscene content, again, with whatever that means. So there, um, it's an attempt to criminalize obscenity uh, beyond just not protecting it. So I think that there are some very clear linkages between where we were when that was passed and where we are today. Um, I am, if I can find it quickly, I will, um, there is a Google doc that some educators are, key, are um, recording on an ongoing basis, the status of legislation across the country at each different state level, where they are attempting to regulate um, or censor at the outset and the criminal code or the legislative civil code, what type of information can be shared? Okay, great, thanks. Um, I I had another um, question. Um, still, uh, there isn't there. We we're still waiting for questions from the audience. Um, you, um, you know. I okay. I'm I'm I I wrote it down here, but I have a lot of notes here, so I can't pull it out. Um, pull it out. Um, quickly. Um, but I I just want to tell you first of all, I, I what I appreciated about this particular uh presentation is you did an excellent job in in providing us information. Um. And you gave us resources, and most importantly, you gave us an action steps. So I just want to say thank you for that. Um, here, here's a question: Is have you how have recent revelations affected mon, moms for liberty? Um, that's a good question, and I I'm not quite sure I'm clear. Vicky, could you um, clarify a little bit about? what you're thinking about there. Um, I, I, and while you're doing that, I will tell you some things that come to mind. Um, I don't know if anybody is watched the National Book Awards. They had all sorts of controversy around them this year. First of all, uh, Drew Barrymore was supposed was the original host of the National Book Awards, was disinvited after there were questions about her lack of support for the Writers Guild strike. Right. Um, LeVar Burton, who I will say is like, I just think a national treasure was invited as the host. But in his opening monologue, um, he stopped in, in his introduction and said, are there any moms in, of Moms for Liberty in the audience? No, then hands will not have to be thrown tonight. Um, it kind of as a glib offhanded joke, um, it was not received well by Moms for Liberty. They accused him of threatening violence against them. Um, it was used at two. It was used at some talks that were held in the next in the subsequent weeks that were also involving fundraising. Um, so I think that, you know, they're very they're very well situated within certain political organizations they've gotten a lot of support 
um, oh goodness, I'm remembering failing to remember, there's a political action committee, the name of which is escaping me right now. Um, and they have used, they've, uh, they just received a big national award from that political action committee. And so it looks like um, their credibility seems to be tarnished given their hypocrisy um, is what Vicki followed up with there. And so, um, Vicki, I would say that I think a lot of that depends on who you ask and their perspective, because these chapters are growing. And I think ultimately what it comes down to is everybody is trying to do what's right for what they think is right for their kids and their community. It just seems to be very different takes on what that looks like. Um, there have been some moves in the past couple of weeks that have really surprised me. Um, and I apologize that I do not have the state off the top of my head, but there was a state where, um, and I, I'll see if I can pop this over and find it, um, where the Moms for Liberty fought back against a ruling at the local community. And they said that the school board should override parents um, if the parents think that materials should stay in the library. And so to your point about kind of where some of that credibility is, I think they're trying to thread a needle that maybe does not always, that maybe the eye of that needle is a little smaller than, they, than uh, they're able to thread. And if I can find that, I will share what state that was in. Well, I, well, I, I thank you. I thank you for trying. And, and if you get the information, you can always send us, um, send it to us and I can forward it to everybody. Um, but um, any, anybody else have any thoughts, any other questions? Um, well, I, um, I, any other, any other last thoughts, um, Mandy, that you want to share with anybody? I think that you've covered, like I said, you've covered um, the information, um, the resources, and the action steps. Um, but any other, any other last last thoughts um, that you would like to share with the audience? I think I would just reiterate that when it starts to feel overwhelming, and I will tell you, like it does, when you start looking into this, it starts to feel overwhelming. And trying to keep up with what's happening, it, it, as you've seen me say, like, oh, what state was that in, and what was going on there? It is happening so much and so quickly that it gets overwhelming, which is why I really want to reinforce that look at your community. That's where your most power is. Um, the other thing that I would say is I have seen attempts to respond to this in kind of, oh yeah, well, let me show you what that what you're really saying kind of way. And what I mean by that is, when we see people say, well, okay, you don't you don't like materials that have X, Y, or Z content. Let me show you the Bible and show you like, there's plenty of violence and sex and all, like whatever you're banning, here's the Bible, let's just ban the Bible. And it becomes this focus on the content that um, almost becomes a tit for tat. And mm -hmm. As tempting as that may be to hold that mirror up and say, that's not what you meant, is it? I would encourage you not to engage in that kind of approach because it really centers the conversation around the content and it just inflames the tensions rather than de-escalating them. Whereas focusing on kind of the fundamental professional values that underlie the approaches that libraries take to selecting material, um, keeping it, it, it can be hard because like we, these are core values, right? So they're like, here's what I think people should be able to do. And you are challenging my core values. So it can be hard to keep that neutral, even feel, but I think it's really important not to just focus on the, what about what you like? Does that make sense? Oh yeah, yeah, okay. definitely. I I think what you said, you know, just a, a few minutes ago, just with regards to, I mean, I think everybody has a definite has their own definition of what's right, 
And I think that that's, you know, when, when you, when you leave um, these laws uh, um, that are these, you know, uh, guidelines, uh, guidelines um, so vague and, and open for interpretation, you're going to get interpretation. So I, I definitely, you know, yes, definitely understand, understand that. Um, so we have no more um, Q and A. Um, so just to just to uh, wrap up, I just want to say again, Mandy, it's been a pleasure. Oh wait, there is another. Um, Northeast Ohio school board members running for offices on school board on school board defeated MOL. It's well, that's encouraging to, to see, and I've seen actually. <laughs> yeah. um, I I saw something the other day that they have. Their members have lost more school board elections in the past year than they did in the year prior. Yeah, well, I think that, you know, it's also been a wake up call in terms of getting getting um, involved in your school district and your communities. I think that, you know, previously there's always been a, you know, your kid goes to school, the school knows best, the school and and, you know, people started asking questions, which are rightly so. Um, and, um, but I, I think that if you're, if you're interested in, and, uh, you have, you want to, you, you got to get involved. So uh, I think that was a big wake up call for, I think, communities across the nation, um, that, uh, it's time to get involved if I don't agree with what's going on in my school district. I agree. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to say uh, thank you very much, Mandy. I'm going to say thank you very much, audience, for joining us. Um, it was a small but very mighty group. So thank you very much, and everybody have a great weekend. Um, stay, stay warm and safe, and have a good evening.